Matthew 7. I believe it takes uh, more brains to make something complex simple than it takes to make something simple complex. And the Lord amazes me in that he can make something so complex simple. We read uh, the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, Matthew 7, verse 12. The Lord Jesus boils all that down to one statement. Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Isn't that amazing how he boiled that down just to one sentence? Okay, and then Matthew 22 uh, there's a fellow that asked Jesus about the great commandments. And again, he boiled it down to two statements. Matthew 22, verse 37, where he said this, uh, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. An escapee, he got away. He caught him. He caught him. Okay, and... Um, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. So when you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four is the first commandment, love the Lord thy God. And then the next six is love thy neighbor as thyself. So here again, the Lord boiled it down. Now you feel all the intricate details when you go back and read everything. Okay, then Paul summarized it in Romans 13, and under the uh, guidance of the Spirit of God, here's how he summarized it. Romans 13, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. So he just focuses on the neighbor side. It is briefly comp comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand this idea, help us to be able to recognize the words that we express to others. And the words that we express to them would be words that we would not mind being expressed to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, I'm going to focus on the neighbor aspect, you know, just like Mr. Rogers. Okay, and um, this is our personal dealings with people, the words that we express to people. Loving thy neighbor as thyself. And so it's only going to be a two-pointer, two-point outline, but I can take an hour on each point. And so, why my wife wrote this for me anyway, so. Uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. The first idea on expressing love to somebody, or the golden rule, do unto others as you would have it be done unto you. Okay, now the golden rule has changed. Murphy's Law has changed it to he who has the gold makes the rules. Okay, but in the Bible... Dealing with people, okay, do unto others as you would have it done unto you. How do you like to be treated? Now, I recognize a lot of people will react accordingly how they were raised. Okay, if they were raised under, you know, verbal abuse, and they think that's how it works, but that's not how it works. Okay, so I'm going to just give you a couple thoughts this morning. The first thought is this, the real test... On this idea, the real test to perform the golden rule in our speech. The real test is when an offense or survival situation takes place. That's the test. Okay, some of us are old enough. Do you remember the blue light specials at Kmart? You know, when I go through stores and people are polite, you know, and kind and all this, and I'm thinking, okay, things are not panicky. These same people will be ballistic on a blue light special in Kmart. In Kmart, blue light special, I mean, the most nicest grandma would take the umbrella and whop somebody if he got in the way. 
Okay, so that's what I'm saying. The, the idea of living the golden rule is really made manifest through offenses and or survival situations. Black Fridays. I never have seen it firsthand. I've watched some of it on YouTube. But the people are just flat nuts. Okay, would they personally, as they ram through the store, stomping on somebody, possibly killing something, would the one that they're stepping on, would they like that be done to them? Of course they would not. So they're not practicing golden rule. Okay, so offenses. Now, if a person takes the time and starts looking at other faiths, and I think you ought to. I don't, you know, a lot of times people think, you know, uh, this, you know, Brett mentioned something this morning where the first commandment is, thou, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. The Lord is not prohibiting us from researching other areas. He's first. And so when you look at other areas, if you look at this unique trait about Jesus Christ in the matter of offenses, did he practice the golden rule? Obviously. Okay, so, example, his reaction. What was the Lord's reaction to the apostles after they forsook him and let him alone and die the crucifixion? What was his reaction next time he saw him? You fellas just left me. I didn't give him. You left me all alone by myself. He didn't even mention it. He did not even mention it. What he did mention was the apostle Peter about denying him, he did not say, Pete, you denied me that, and you even cussed, I heard you, and I saw you after you did it. He, all he said was, Pete, do you love me? Three times, that's all he said. That was his reaction to those great offenses. Judas Iscariot, when the Lord knew that Judas was coming to betray him, what was his reaction? He said, friend, that's what he said to him. If you just look at that one trait of Jesus Christ, that is worthy of his worship. That right there. On the cross of Calvary, what was his reaction to the people who crucified him? I mean, normally when we are greatly offended by somebody, with time we can say, okay, I can forgive or bury the hatchet. The Lord Jesus Christ on the day of the crucifixion, to the people who were murdering him, said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I mean, that right there is all, all, uh, something to be considering. Okay, and his enemies, Romans chapter 5 says he died for his enemies. And he bore our great offenses. So what I'm saying on this idea is the real test of us behaving, uh, obeying the golden rule towards our neighbor is really manifested through offenses or survival situations. Okay, that's what it's really made manifest. You see, I am not held accountable for the actions people commit against me, good or bad. I'm not responsible for that. I am responsible for my reaction. Okay, now, if somebody commits a grave offense against me, that's one wrong. But when I react improperly, now there's two wrongs. And a person says, well, I have a right to react that way. No, we don't. An example in the Bible is in Numbers chapter 20. I'm just going to cite some passages instead of taking time looking at them. Numbers 12 <clears throat> made a statement that Moses was the very meek. First time the word meek is found in the Bible. Meekness toward a man who is a leader of two to three million people generally is not within the mindset. Okay, we would not think that a meek man could lead two to three million people out of Egypt, but he did. That meek individual in Numbers chapter 20 was pushed to the limit by the Jews where they got chiding him and griping at him. They were thirsty. You brought him out here to die. Give us some water and a drink. And then Moses and Aaron went to the Father, went to the God, and God said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Go speak to that rock, and water's going to come out. And Moses, a meek man, had been pushed to his limit, was angry. You stinking Jews, I am so sick of this. And he hits the rock, instead of speaks to it, water came out, 
That was his reaction, and it is, not, is it not an understandable reaction if a bunch of people are griping at you to be angry? That was his reaction, and what was God's accountability? Moses and Aaron, sorry, you can't go into the land of Canaan. They were held accountable for that, just as we are held accountable, okay, for our reaction toward things. Now, Moses' anger, that is the typical reaction, is it not, when somebody offends us? Okay, driving down a road, going to make a, you know, go over down the interstate, you're going to veer over, and somebody, what's our normal reaction? Oh, dear, you beep at me. Well, they say, they could have saved an accident. Now, if they kept going by and they, you know, went like that to you, okay, you know, but still, what's our reaction? Just the same reaction I did to a kid down at Purdue where he was, and I just kept going like this at him. <laughs> okay, and so uh, the reaction generally is anger. Now, the word anger is one letter shy of the word danger. Now, the Bible talks about anger. And I know the pious man that's going to say, well, the Bible says be angry and sin not. Yeah, but 99% of our anger is sinful. Okay, and with anger often arises spirits. It brings things to a different level. Okay, I'll read a few verses out of Proverbs on the word anger. Now, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, when you get mad about something, why do we get mad? It's because we didn't get our way. Is that not true? Because I did not get my way. It wasn't the way I thought it should be, so I'm angry. No, no different than a two-year-old temper tantrum. No different than that. It's just now an adult. You can see you can be young once, but you can be immature all your life. Okay, for angry words, Proverbs 15, verse 1, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. It just gets hotter and hotter. 15:18 A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Proverbs 16:32 He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. The greatest soldier is the man who can conquer himself. That's, that's better than anybody else. Alexander the Great, great soldier, conquered a known world by the time he was 30, couldn't conquer a bottle with alcohol. And he's a chronic drunk by the time he was 16. Couldn't conquer that. I don't know if they had bottles back in those days. I don't know what it was. Okay, but you see, ruling your spirit. Proverbs 19, verse 11. And I know none of us are going to bet a thousand of these things. We're all going to lose it. Proverbs 19.11, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over transgression. Now, we go into the, oh, I, I forgot Solomon, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. And nothing like sports really brings it out. Okay, now in the New Testament. Now, what I made a statement about the word anger. When a person gives forth critical words with an angry attitude, that, that has invited unclean spirits to enforce those angry words. When the same individual is you know, a little bit pious, where he can give forth the good words, the Bible words in an angry spirit, it's like unclean spirits gloss over the angry words and they don't even get across. Ephesians 4.26 Okay, years ago, uh, when I was in school, I wanted to memorize Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. And it was the springtime, so I'm in the tractor, and my brother's planting, so he had to go straight. I didn't have to go straight, so I had a New Testament. I got Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 memorized. Verse 26 states, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. Now, those two verses are one sentence. If you follow the punctuation of 26, the implications with those two verses, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So if you get mad at 6.01, you've got 11 hours and 59 minutes to get over it. 12 hours long enough. 
If you don't unclean spirits step in, neither give place to the devil. And that tells us, and you, you know, I know that if a person says words to you, when they throw in their emotion of anger, those words in heighten. Okay, and that's spirits that coming through. And that's even when, I, you know, I've seen preachers preach mad, and they think they're going to declare the word of God. Yeah, but James 1 verse 20 says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When we're giving forth the words of God in an angry tone, you might as well just keep your mouth shut because you're not getting anything accomplished. Okay, but that's how it goes. And why is the preacher mad? Probably because he didn't get his way. In Colorado, the guy was notorious. If he had a low day like this, he would yell at us for the ones who weren't there. I thought, that'll make sense. But he would be downright mad. Don't you realize the world revolves around me and I'm here... And you've got to come here and live, listen to my vast wisdom, no matter how bad it is outside. That's the mindset. Okay, so this idea of being angry. Anger is evidence that I didn't get my way. You know, that, that's stinking tire got flat, stinking tire. I don't want to mess with that. Kick the tire, hurt your toe. Kick the car, hurt your fist. Got a dent in the car, now you got to fix it. Makes a lot of sense, but I think we men, we could say we've probably all done it. Bust your knuckles with a wrench on the engine, throw the wrench. It wasn't the wrench. It just makes you feel better. Okay, so the real test to perform the golden reel is offenses. Okay, the second, th second thought is learn to love lead and serve thy neighbor. Okay, so we're dealing with our relationships. Now, who is my neighbor, Mr. Rogers? Okay, that's what a guy asked Jesus in Luke 10, where Jesus Christ said, love thy neighbor, and he, as a smart Alex, said, who's my neighbor? Well, who is your neighbor? We think the guy that lives next to us. Okay, but in reality, the word neighbor in the Bible is anybody who's within your sphere of influence. Anybody you walk by. Your family, your friends, your foes, your work, uh, uh, fellow laborers on the job. That's your neighbor. In the Bible, the word neighbor is spelled different than we do. We drop the U, and neighbor is at the end is our. It's more than two people. So that's our neighbor. Now, love, lead. Now, the word lead, we have... Our Gentiles, we got a whole different mindset of the word a leader, a leadership. Oh, Hillary Clinton, she's a leader. She's a leader. No, she's not. She ain't a leader. Most government entities are not leaders. They're tyrants. They're bullies. Why is this? What did Jesus say is the mindset of a Gentile in a matter of leadership? Gentiles, what? He said, twice he said it, lord it over you. That's what they think is a leader. I say that's a tyrant. That's a bully. The words that they do, the words that they... He's a strong leader. How do you know that? Challenge him and he'll show you. That's a bully. He'll either intimidate or manipulate. Those are the two things that they'll do. The intimidation is usually on the male side. The manipulation is usually on the female side. But I've seen them intermingle. That's not a leader. Okay, a leader is somebody who creates an atmosphere that causes people to want to be around you. They want to follow you, per se, follow your lead. That's a leader. They create an atmosphere that people say, hey, I like that. I want to do that. I want to be with that individual. I want to follow that individual. That's a leader. But you see, in a Gentile mindset, we think that a leader is somebody who lords it over you. They are a strong leader. They're going to have discipline. And if you're going to challenge them, then they're going to step on your face to get their way. That's a tyrant. That's a bully. Okay, that's all it is. This is how a lot of pastors rule. And this is a warning Peter said to him: Don't lord it over them. Be an example. But how do most pastors take up an offering? They throw a guilt trip. Or God's going to curse you if you don't tithe, especially here. 
That's a guilt trip. That's intimidation. That's not a leader. And there's a lack of faith. Oh, pastor, pastoral authority. Oh, yeah. Got a little insecurity problem? Yeah, insecurity problem. It's like a pastor preaching heavy and hot heavy. Wives, submit unto your own husbands. And he's there going, amen. Did you read a verse in front of it? Submitting yourselves one to another in fear of God. Did you read that one? You see, to me, that's nothing but a bully. It's an insecurity. It's using a Bible as a hammer to whap somebody in the head. Do this. Yeah, but what about over this? And that's not a leader. Ask, uh, if you get some time, talk to Brent. Ask him about some of his experiences. Oh, there's one guy out west that, boy, he got a, he's got a reputation with missionaries. If you drive in his parking lot with a dirty car, he will tell you to get that off my lot and don't come back until it's washed. If that were me, I would drive off, find a dirt road, throw more dirt on it, and then bring it back in. But that guy's got a real reputation with several missionaries, and that's not a leader. That's a bully. So that's what that is. A leader allows people the liberty to disagree without displaying anger or frustration. That's a leader. You don't have to agree with me 100%. When I coached uh, Brent and Luke as they're coming up through the ranks, Little League, T-ball, that stuff, when Brent was so little, back in those days, they didn't, they have, the T-ball was the smallest age, was seven years old. He was six. And, you know, when he got to bat, he ran a third base. Hey, that's closer than first. <laughs> I thought it was pretty smart. <laughs> okay, but when I was a coach, I, you know, I really didn't like coaching. I did it because my boys were playing. My one rule was this. Before we started a year, I'd sit the little tykes down. I'd say, okay, here's what we're going to do. You are never... In my presence, say something bad to another player. You're not going to ridicule another player. You're not going to yell at another player. You're not going to criticize another player. All you are going to do to another player is say good words. You're not going to say anything wrong in my presence to another player. That's the coach's job. You're not going to give them your vast wisdom of playing your game with all your one experience, your experience. Not going to do it. And I did not allow it, and it didn't happen. Okay? If a kid did show a little frustration with another player, I'll pull him aside and say, hey, we don't do that. One time I was coaching practice, and this one loudmouth mother was trying to get her kid to go from first to second yelling, and as soon as she yelled, I said, stay on first. And then she goes, yeah, do what the coach says. Thank you very much, lady. Mind your own business. <laughs> Okay, and so the idea is, I believe that a player, okay, if a player is showing uh, his disgust about a mistake of another player, do they do it to him? I tell you, if they did, he's going to be upset. I don't like it if somebody would point out, a, you know, where I made a big mistake and rub it in my face, so I'm not going to do that to somebody else. That's part of the golden rule. Now, in basketball, a lot of you know I like to play basketball. Okay, I'll do experiments when I go to a, a, a gym where they don't, really don't know me. And I've done this multiple times. My experiment goes like this, okay? Since I was a runt growing up, four, fourth grade, I was a runt until, my, until I got my driver's license. When I got my driver's license, I was a whopping five foot six inches tall, okay? Big kid, okay? I was called peewee. Everybody kept calling me Pee Wee, and then I started to grow in my junior year. And one kid who didn't grow was shorter, he still called me Pee Wee. Everybody else called me Hoff from then on up. So because I was small, I was a point guard. A point guard is the quarterback of a team. Okay, and so what I do is I do experiments. After high school, you go out to certain places to play. I don't demand a ball. I don't call for the ball. I don't go, <laughs> pass me the ball. I never call for the ball, never demand the ball. But what I do is I'll throw, when I get in a game, I'll throw the ball to who I think was a, a, either a guard or a, a shooting guard who might lead the team. I'll throw it to them the first time down. 
And then I'll wait to see how soon they start throwing it back to me to lead the game. It's usually about three times up and down the court where they voluntarily will throw it back to me and say, you take charge. And it's never, never do I ask for it. It just happens. It just happens. Why? They recognize something. They recognize something. And then we just have a good time from then on out. <laughs> okay, Juan has probably experienced the same thing. He's a point guard. Okay, and the thing is, is that's a part of leadership. Now, if I demanded the ball and said, throw me the ball, then I would not be a leader. I would be a bully trying to get my way, wanting to be the tension of the thing. This is what a leader does. Okay, now, we've all seen this. You ever see someone who gets a position or a uniform and a badge and how they change attitude? Has anybody ever experienced the wonderful experience of picking something at someone up at O'Hare Airport and then the women there who are the coppers to blow to us, move that car! Oh, does that get under my skin? I want to say, you move right over here and I'll put a speed bump right in front of me. How many of us love the lecture from Barney Fife when we get stopped? Don't we love that? Oh, we just love the lecture. You know, I think Paul and Debbie was telling me about that. One time he was driving a country road and a copper stopped and then lectured them about being on the other side of the road or something like that. What a joke. Okay, so, okay, let's say you've gotten hired on a new job. You are a park supervisor. The owner of the park, it's either a private corporation or it's a municipal park, which is another form of a corporation. So, like, the town of Lowell is a corporation. I don't know if people know that. That's a municipality. That means that when you come into the city limits of the town of Lowell, you've got to comply with the corporate rules of this town. That's just understood. Okay, so if you have a park, you've been hired by the town or a private corporation to uh, police the park, and they don't want anybody sleeping on the bench. You've got you a nice uniform. You've got a nice stick. You've got a taser. You're going to make sure that you enforce it. Let's start from the top down here. The number five guy, when he sees somebody at a park bench, takes his nightstick, whaps him on the ankle, and says, Hey, pal, get out of here. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to drag you out of here. And a guy takes his taser out, tases him, and drags him off. He got the job done, right? That's the limit. Now, what's that guy's alternative if that doesn't work? Shoot him. And some cops do that and justify they shouldn't have done that. You shot a man because they challenged your authority? Okay, that's number five. Let's step it down to number four, where it's just a verbal abuser. Not a physical abuser, just a verbal abuser. Hey, hey tub of lard, get off the seat. Get out of here. You're supposed to get out of here. Nobody's supposed to sleep here. I ain't putting up with it. I want you to get out of here. Get moving. Get going. Get going. Get out of here. That's a verbal abuser. He didn't touch him, but he just raked the coal. Now, would the guy doing that appreciate if somebody did that to him? Of course he would. Okay, step number three down. The next guy down is just a matter of fact of an individual. No, he's the manipulator. This would be the woman cop. Oh, I've been hired. When would you get off the bench? Come on, you know, I mean, they provided this place not for you to sleep, but I'm going to lose my job if you don't get off the bench. That's the manipulator. A little whiny on that thing. Okay, and then there's a guy who's just a matter of fact cop. Just says, hey, I hate to tell you this, but uh, <clears throat> the rules, the owner here doesn't want anybody sleeping on a bench, uh, so I'm asking you to just take off. Okay, matter of fact, not too bad. Okay, but how about this one? Okay, walk over to the guy. He's sleeping away. You hear him snoring. Nudge him a little bit. Hey, you okay? You okay? Fella, I hate to tell you, but boss don't want people sleeping here. Are you hurting? Need a place to go? Could I take you someplace to go so you can get some rest? Now, if I was the guy sleeping on a bench, that's what I would appreciate. 
Now, all five of them got the job done, right? All five of them. Now, unfortunately, that's usually how houses are run. Now, granted, I'm not saying that's how you talk to your kids all the time. You know, number, I mean, if the kid's out in the street, I'm not saying, hey, would you please get out of the street? I'm not saying that. That's the time you yell. Okay? But our words that we express to people <clears throat> are significant. Okay? If I was that individual down and outer, if I was an individual in a situation like that, it would be very nice of somebody to try to help me out. Now, granted, I realize there's a situation where people like that want to be like that. I realize that a lot of homeless people want to be homeless. I understand that, too. But to apply this principle, this idea, if you would look in Proverbs 29, you ever see a, a job or a company that has a con constant turnover rate on employees? Constant. One reason for that could be a lack of character of this age. Okay, that could be one reason. But another reason could be that they feel abused on the job. <clears throat> Proverbs 29, verse 15, 17, 19, and 21 has some very interesting ideas in the matter of our words expressed to another. Okay, verse 22 says, An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. That's the abusive foreman. Okay, verse 17 says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. So there's a relationship that you can correct them by your words, and the behavior will change. In this age, as a parent, if you cannot correct your children by your eyes in public, then you need to work on that. Because you don't want to lay your hand on a child in public. So if your child's misbehaving in public, you can either look at them in the eyes and they see a crusty coming. My wife's good at crusties. <laughs> and that should change the behavior. Okay? Or a little whisper in the ear. Because we live in a pretty tough age. But verse 17, correct thy son. So the idea is thy son. Now verse 19, it says this. A servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. That is an employee <clears throat> that has just got a job and a foreman starts yelling and screaming at him and this person says, I ain't taking this. You see, that individual has not developed a relationship with that person to have the right to correct them verbally. How does he bring that servant up to a son? Verse 21 says, He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. <clears throat> when a person has delicately been brought up and trained, then a person may have the right, if need be, to chew them out, and they'll get changed behavior. But that's a long process. See, you apply this in the business world, this will help being a leader, and people will not hate the leader, but they will appreciate it because they know you care for them. You find this in the business world, you find this in church. I realize it's a church, and I realize the Bible portrays the ministry as a military. And I realize a lot of things that happen in the ministry is like the military. But I also know this, that you people walk in this door voluntarily of your free will. I can't demand you to walk in here. You voluntarily can walk out. You see, where that aspect is, you got to realize, hey, we're volunteers, and how do we work with that? We've got to work together in these things. And love thy neighbor as thyself. <clears throat> I was researching a little bit about the Apple, the iPhones. You know those things are made by hand? Foxconn is a company in China that builds 50% of our electronic devices and the workers get paid less than $2 an hour. 
They have even down to 12 year olds. Most of them are young people working there, working 12 to 15 hours a day. And then on their off time, they go to a building where they have seven of them sleeping in the same room. They actually leave their families for this. Of course, for leaving their poor family, this is a step up from them. And there's such a high suicide rate, their solution for the suicide rate was to build nets around the building so if they jump over, they'll land in the net. What about the work situation? What about treat, treating people with some kindness? The one plant employs 400 million, and they employ a, hundred, a million throughout the country. This is the Apple iPhone. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't buy from China. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this is the abuse that's taking place because this is how Gentiles think. I'm going to lord it over you. Now, the ones that fault here are not us who buy the products. The ones that fault are the corporate heads who are abusing these people and trying to hide it. That's the ones that fault. Okay, and so, but the idea is we can apply this principle that <clears throat> working under somebody, you know, you know, of course, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate to work under my dad all the years. I realized I had to get up farming because I could never give, I could only be third on the rung. I could never change that. <laughs> so I had, there's no way for me to move up the corporate ladder. Dad, Ronnie, me. Okay, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm always going to be third. <laughs> okay, but so kind in how we did work. Okay, not yelling and screaming. Praise me for when I do the right thing. You know, I, you know, I was spoiled in that. Looking back, I appreciate it so much. Yeah, we worked hard. Okay, but still, it was a pleasure to work there. I, I don't know how many times I heard my dad pray, Lord, it is such a blessing to work together. And as a kid, I'm thinking, why does he pray that? And I look back and say, wow, that was a blessing. That's such a blessing. When I first fill out my first resume, you know, I said, when do you start working? And I said, at birth. The last job, birth. That's when I started. <laughs> okay, but you see, this is where a person appreciates the foreman. How, how do most people on a job look at the foreman? They don't appreciate him, do they? Oh, jerk, so-and-so's coming. Okay, and so there's ways that we can love, lead, and serve thy neighbor. Now, granted, I know the exception proves the rule. Okay, but the thing is that we are held accountable for our reactions. Okay, as far as what people do to us, then our reaction by the grace of God, where we can bite our tongue when we're angry, from the reaction, we can bite our tongue at that moment because Will Rogers said, he that flies off in a rage always makes a bad landing. And that's so true. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, we'll stop here. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for your words. I thank you for your testimony <clears throat> that when people committed grave offenses against you, <clears throat> that... Oh, man, just the reaction you gave. Amazing. And I pray you'd help us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That puts us in a leadership role just because we're saved, hoping that we can lead another to Jesus Christ. And how will we do that? Well, hopefully by your grace that you'd give us the right words to say at the right time to the right person with the right spirit. And we would pray for the right response. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay.